Hi, everyone. Welcome to week seven. I'm going to try to keep this presentation relatively brief because as you may have seen from the checklist for this week or this week's posts, I'm also hoping to, to get a little bit of FaceTime with everyone this week. There's still a number of you that I haven't spoken to over Zoom, so I'm really hoping we can find the time to chat. The theme for this week is kind of a joking title called Living on the Grid, as opposed to Living Off the Grid, but it's a reference to the Swiss style, the international style, also called the Swiss typographic style. There's a number of different names for this movement that emerged in Switzerland in the 1960s. And as you know from the readings, this movement relied heavily on using grids not just as a strategy, as a technical tool, but as a philosophy for design. You may have also noticed, and if you read the brief introductions to each of these texts for this week, I sort of played a trick on you and gave you a, a text that's way before uh, the other two. I've mixed up the order uh, as compared to how they appear in the uh, graphic design theory book. Actually, the Herbert Beyer text that we read a couple of weeks ago was written in the 1960s and appears in the same section of that book as the Carl Gerstner and Joseph Mueller Brockman texts, whereas the Chickle text is written long before uh, the other two and is sort of paired with the writings from around the time of the Bauhaus, which is when it was written. But I've broken them up a little differently because I think it's important to see the connections between these different schools of thought. The Chickle text was hugely influential to the artists, uh, designers working in the 1960s. And Chickle wasn't really actually sort of ever uh, a part of the Bauhaus. He wasn't a student or an instructor there. So I think it's fun to see the different connections. Anyhow, we'll get to all of them. Before that, I wanna rewind even further and look at exactly what Chickold's talking about in his text, the old typography, right? This is the premise, the new typography must be opposed to something. And of course there was all different types and styles of typography, but this will give you a sense, this image shows you exactly what Jan Chickold is talking about when he, addresses the problems in typography. Now, at first glance, this seems pretty typical of an old manuscript, right? And this is actually a text that was uh, published. It's from a book that was published only a few years prior to, to Chickold's uh, publication of the new typography. Now, remember, he points to some of the problems here. There's no hierarchy of, of uh, font sizes. There's really no good reason for this type to be divided up in the way that it is. It's purely decorative. It's purely superficial. There's the only planning seems to be fitting each word onto the lines. And that's not in any way related to the importance of the information portrayed, right? So Chickle thought that this was a, a really ineffective means of, of communicating and was not in line with the modern ideals of, of what a, a good typographer should be doing in the 20th century. So Chickle came up with a whole new system. We only saw a very small excerpt from this longer, it's a book length uh, piece of writing called the New Typography in which Chickle talks about all the principles that he believes are important for typographers in the 20th century. And he himself was a trained typographer. He had experience in print shops. So he had a very deep technical knowledge of what he was talking about. So the new typography that he's advocating looks something like this. And you should have no problem uh, discerning the difference between the two different styles, right? Um, right off the bat, we don't have this uh, central axis on which everything revolves. Instead, we have mostly we have left or right justified in this, each according to the line in which it appears. The overarching principle and probably the word that appears more than any other in this essay is clarity. 
this is the idea is that typography like this one, like, like this example here should be more clear to read. It should create a hierarchy of information. It should, it, it should follow a rigid system that creates a logical order in which you will approach the content. Now, it just so happens that aesthetically, there seems to be a trend with uh, typographers along the time. And I think it's interesting to compare this. We're building up an inventory of different philosophies about typography. So if we compare it to previous weeks, I think we see an interesting relationship here. Note that Herbert Beyer was deeply influenced by Jan Chickhold. Uh, Chickhold's thinking, Chickhold, uh, came and saw a Bauhaus exhibition and immediately was enamored with the new typography and then started to create his own work, which in turn influenced different students and instructors at the Bauhaus. So there is a very real and direct connection between the type of work that Jan Chickhold was, was creating and, and the ambitions that Herbert Beyer was expressing in his own universal typeface. And both of these are, are slightly different from uh, the typography that Beatrice Ward was advocating about a decade later in her essay, The Crystal Goblet. Nevertheless, there are interesting connections and there certainly are some relationships to be seen uh, when we think about the, the use of uh, simplified, uh, sans serif typefaces, which are used for their clarity, for their impact, and uh, for the logical uh, capacities that, that they might contain. So again, we're sort of building this inventory of typefaces, and we should be thinking about the relationships between not just the sort of final appearance, but also the philosophies behind these different typefaces. It's also important to see some of the ways in which Chickold was employing his typography. He was absolutely opposed to any superficiality in design. He was thinking about form. He was thinking about the function of the typography. He was thinking about objectivity. Now, whether or not this is somehow inherently more objective than a traditional use of, of typography, uh, is in itself a subjective assessment, I think, <laughs> if you could follow that. Um, but this is exactly what he was striving for, to utilize space in not just a dynamic way, but in an objective and meaningful type of way. Asymmetry is one of the primary tools for doing so. And Chickold was contrasting this use of asymmetry with what he called the neo or, or the the uh, the neo or the quasi constructivists, right? He saw that the constructivists has, had had this uh, massive impact on the way people were were working, but designers were copying Rodchenko or Lizitsky in a totally superficial way, with no good reason for doing so. Chickold believed that a good designer should internalize the ideas of the constructivists, understand why pieces of their approach were important to the design itself, and then assess their own design problem and determine what the best approach would be for that particular situation. It's obviously somewhat different for this Buster Keaton film than it would have been for the films that Rodchenko was designing posters for. And another example, and again, for a constructivist exhibition, it's appropriate to be, to be thinking about this. Chickhold's experiments in typography and his approach to typography had a massive influence, as I said, on Herbert Beyer, but also on artists like Laszlo moholy Nagy. We see a kind of typo photo type image here. moholy Nagy very specifically employed some of Chickhold's principles when it came to designing the books for the Bauhaus, including his own, in which he writes the essay on, uh, on typo photo. So there's an immediate impact 
from Chickold's thinking. And it's not necessarily part of the Bauhaus approach, but it immediately becomes influential there. And it's going to have much further reaching influences as we see the development of design through the 1950s and 1960s, particularly in Switzerland. Now, Chickold was born in Germany and began his career there, thus the relationship to the Bauhaus. <laughs> but as the Bauhaus confronted troubles from local authorities as the Nazis came to power, so did uh, Chickold. And he fled Germany, he, he went straight to Switzerland, and he ended up working there for the rest of his career, and thus another reason for the influence on the Swiss style that emerges in the 1950s and 1960s. He was, uh, he, he became a local and had a, had a great influence on that school. However, long before that style emerged and started using principles from the new typography, Chickold abandoned the very methodology that he advocated. He was the strongest voice for the new typography. And then he broke away from, from that approach relying instead on uh, mostly serif typefaces and going back to very traditional styles. This is another, uh, another advertisement for a typeface that he developed. Note that this is only six years after the new typography. He very quickly changed his approach. And that's because he saw an ideological problem behind the new typography. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned there's certain lines in Maholi Naj's type of photo essay where he talks about the hygiene of the visible, the, the clarity of the optical. The same with, the, the same sort of language exists in Chickold's writing. And he saw that similar language was being used by the Nazi par party. And they were thinking about uh, the hygiene of society. And of course, that contains racist undertones. And Chickold was so put off by, by this shift in power and so concerned with the technological warfare that was brewing at the time. And he believed his, his typographic movement might have been a part of that. And for fear of any kind of involvement, for fear of harming society through his typographic work, he shifted his approach dramatically and instead went back to uh, very, uh, very traditional type styles. We can see another example here. This is a page design uh, from Jan Chikol, the, the very author of the new typography. And he continued to work in this way for the rest of his life. He also went back even to some uh, medieval type thinking. And he looked at uh, strategies for page design going back to pre-modern eras. And he started using some, some of the ratios, some of the principles. This is called the secret canon. There's a mathematical equation for sizing your images, for uh, determining where your type will lie, and for uh, constructing your, your page layouts. And rather than rely on the new typography through the entire later part of his career, Chickold instead <laughs> resorted to this methodology. And, and this he continued to do for most of his life. However, by the time he was doing this, the new typography had already had a massive impact and it wasn't all negative. There was a lot of very positive um, design work that came from it and really modern thinking, high modern thinking in the middle to late 20th century owes a great deal to the new typography. And there's many great productive designs that are, if not directly influenced by it, certainly related. And that goes well beyond just the typographic. I wanted to show you a couple of examples of different design strategies on completely different levels that I think are very well aligned with the type of thinking that Chickold was employing. I'll start with the red 
the red and blue chair by Garrett Riedfeld. This is something you may have seen in other classes. If not, it's, it's an important design object and it's a piece of furniture design. Garrett Riedfeld devised this chair as something that could be constructed from normal, easily purchased lumber. So you could walk into whatever the equivalent to Home Depot was back in, in, uh, in Amsterdam in 1920s. Um, but uh, you know, the idea was that um, you, could, you could go to any ordinary store that sold lumber, buy the correct pieces, cut them down to the, the correct length, you know, buy the two by fours or whatever the metric equivalent is, um, and with a tape measure and a saw, you could very easily construct this chair on your own. And he made the plans widely available to anyone who wanted to create it. And, and then it had to be painted. It didn't even have to be painted in these certain colors. But the idea is you have a modular system here. You have something that can very easily and relatively inexpensively be created by anyone. And it has these qualities of logic, of objectivity, of efficiency, of functionality. And this is exactly what not only Jan Chikold, but many of the designers in the Bauhaus were striving towards. Riedfeld was associated with the De Stiel movement, which is uh, more or less contemporary to the Bauhaus. Another example of these sort of modular systems, these, this logical approach to design can be found in the work of Le Corbusier, who was an architect initially associated with the international style that Walter Gropius so strongly advocated. And we see a, a slightly later building here from Corbusier. And obviously we're employing some kind of a grid here and we're looking at this large modular system. Cabousier's idea for a building like this one was that there are different variations on the same apartment. And if you purchased a unit in one of these buildings, you would not only take the sort of floor layout as it came, but you would also design certain elements for your unit. You would select the color scheme that would be used. You'd select the furniture that would be contained within, and you would have an entire living system for your home uh, devised according to this modular grid. And Cabousier advocated this uh, early on. This is a, a project from the 1940s, 1950s, but this is the type of, uh, of thinking that Cabousier applied, very similar to the new typography, but now it's applied to architecture. Now it's not just something on the page, it's something that exists for the whole home. And thinkers like Cabousier and Chickold influenced one another. Uh, Cabousier was already working and influencing uh, Chickold in, in his typographic sense, and then vice versa, back and forth. You see a, a relationship where it's not just isolated fields. Each one is kind of um, having an effect on the other. Anyhow, so now we finally move towards the Swiss school, the Swiss style. We read two texts from Carl Gerstner and from Joseph Mueller Brockman. This is the type of design that both writers are advocating for. We can call it minimal, that really doesn't quite do it justice. Minimalism was a sort of separate art movement that was occurring uh, mostly in the US around the same time, certainly some shared sentiments, but uh, not quite the same type of thinking. The idea of the Swiss school, the Swiss typographic school was that everything would be logical, everything would be simplified, certainly, but it would be done so for effectiveness. And again, to borrow from uh, Chickold's words, it would be done for clarity. You could establish a logical approach to your design and stick with that to streamline the design process. We typically see the use of these sans serif typefaces. Accidents Grotesque is actually probably the most common one. 
and universe, and then Helvetica. They all look very similar. It's, it's difficult to uh, discern between them. I know that Helvetica has gotten a sort of moment in the spotlight due to the film, but really Exodens Grotesque is, is a little bit more common uh, with the Swiss school. Carl Gerstner, writing in the 1960s, advocates for his approach in a text called Designing Programs. This is what we read an excerpt from, that's the actual title of the full book, and we, we read a, a small section from this book. It's a really fascinating text. It is actually pretty difficult to use, but it's filled with these incredible ideas. It's not a very practical handbook, but it will certainly make you think. It was out of print for a long time and people would pay thousands of dollars to get their hands on a copy. And then just in, in 2019, it went back into print and you can find it. It's still relatively expensive, but I think one of the most fascinating uh, design texts you'll, you'll ever encounter. Grissner's idea is that you should build a program you should approach every design in a systematic kind of way with a logical approach that never starts from a blank slate. You always start from, from a certain kind of methodology. You always start with a certain system in place and then devise that system, accommodate it to the project at hand. He sees this as a common characteristic for all design ever. And one of the examples he gives in, in his book, which I think is a really fascinating one, is the windows on this medieval cathedral. He says he would drive past this cathedral every day on his way to work. And what you're seeing is all the ground level windows. He went back and took a photograph of each window. He said there's 16 windows on the cathedral, but there's only 15 reproduced in the book because it sort of it meets the layout a little bit better, I suppose. And he, he notices something as he drives past these windows every day. At first glance, they're all quite similar. They appear to be the same window. But on further examination, each one is different. What Gerstner determines from looking at this is that there's a program in play. There are certain qualities behind each window, the nine panes of glass in the lower panel, the shape of the window, the directions of the lines, the point, the ways in which the curved lines intersect are common amongst all of the windows. But the architect, the designer of this cathedral was playing around with a, with a program, had, had a little bit of fun making the windows and did each one differently, had a different approach for each window. And this is an example of how the, there's a certain set of established criteria that the designer can pick and choose from. And this is exactly what we see in the section that we read in this piece that Gerstner calls the morphological box of the typogram. And if you didn't follow exactly what he was saying, fine. Again, it's something that is a little tricky to follow. The idea here is that whenever you sit down to uh, solve a typographic problem, whenever you sit down to design, you should go back to your table and you can think about all of the questions that you might ask yourself, but do so in a systematic kind of way. We start with the basis of the words. What are the components of the design? Are you designing a logo for a company? Is it a new brand identity? And is it going to be a word, a set of words, an abbreviation, and so on? Then we'll choose the type of typeface we'll use. We'll choose the technique. Will it be written by hand? Will it be drawn? Is it typeset as in composed? And then what color will it be? Uh, what, what values? Will, will it be light, dark? medium and will it be chromatic, meaning are there colors to it or is it just black and white? The idea, and then, then we go on, we start thinking about the appearance. Does the proportion change? Does the uh, inclination, meaning uh, is it, uh, and the reading direction, does it, does it appear at an angle or does it appear reversed? All these are possibilities for altering your typeface. 
The idea is that rather than sitting down with a blank slate and, and beginning new every time, you know that these are the variables. You know that these are all of the possibilities that you might employ when you're setting type. So why not start with your possibilities and work from there rather than you know, trying to start brand new every time? And this is the type of design that Gerstner develops from this system. Again, we, we see all these sort of different variables at play and we see that he's taken this approach and this time he's added a photographic element to it, but we can still go through and we can talk about uh, the, the appearance, we can talk about the uh, shades, the values. It is achromatic, it's only black, white, and gray. We can look at the reading direction from left to right, right to left, or combined. Uh, we can also look at something like the design. Is it unmodified or modified? Is something added or is there a combination of these things? Has the form been modified? Really, it hasn't been. All he's done is replaced uh, or shared the N and the Z. And it's this sort of very simple uh, design trick that comes from a very complicated uh, sort of thinking. And it actually proves to be a very effective way to design. He also says that you do not have to do this every time. Once you're used to working in this way, you might not sit down with the box, but, but the morphological table is still a very powerful tool for looking at others' design, for understanding what a designer has done and taking away the parts that you respect or admire and maybe employing them in your own design. The other example that we see in, in this text is uh, the modular grid that he's going to use for the magazine capital. And uh, if you thought the morphological box was confusing, you really have to do some math for this one. <laughs> uh, the idea here, which is, which is very much lost on the single diagram, and, and you, you can look up this, this modular grid, you can find all different variations of it online, it's very worth uh, your time to do so if you're if you're curious about how this works. But the idea here is that uh, Gerstner recognizes that if you divide this square page into 58 units, you can then have two columns. You can create a, a grid with uh, two rows, two columns, and then we'll leave sort of two, uh, two units in between, or you can divide it into three columns with two in between you can divide it into four columns and so on. And there's all these different possibilities for creating different grids that fit on the same page. So his idea is that you can create all these different variations and you have a model to begin with. You're not going to start laying out each page completely separately every time. You're gonna start with your system and ask, do I want two columns and two rows here? Or do I want five columns and five rows? And of course the content of each particular page will dictate what's the appropriate number of rows and columns. We might take some of this for granted today in the world of InDesign where most things are sort of laid out before we begin. But that was not the case for a designer like Carl Gerstner. Remember, this was all done manually when somebody was sitting at a drafting table. So this was a very powerful tool for designers to use. And it was tools like this one that actually made the transition to digital design very easy. Writers, designers such as Carl Gerstner, and as we'll see, Joseph Mueller Brockman, really paved the way for digital design. And here's one more example from uh, designing programs. And it's a similar approach. Create a grid and approach this car. It's an advertisement for a car. Approach it from every angle possible. In doing that, we have what appears to be a very logical, systematic approach. We have this modular grid. And we have the appearance of objectivity. I would also argue that we have something that is beautiful. We have something with a particular rhythm to it. And for all the calls towards objectivity and mathematical approaches and everything like that, these designers were really also making things that looked good and they knew they looked good. And 
that's something that we can't escape from, I think, no matter how rigid your system is, if it doesn't have a certain beauty to it, then it might not quite work. But maybe that's a question that's up for debate. And then we get to Joseph Mueller Brockman and we encountered a very short piece uh, from his book, which is, uh, which is called Grid Systems. This book is an excellent technical manual with a combination of philosophy and real world design strategies. If, you, if you're looking for the book that gives you a, a practical system, uh, go with Joseph Mueller Brockman's. If you're looking at the one that's fun and has sort of weird approaches to design, go with Carl Gerstner. I think they're actually both really excellent resources that combine philosophy and practical advice. But Mueller Brockman, on the whole, tends towards the practical. The piece that we get is almost the sort of, it's, it's from the opening chapters and it's a little bit of the manifesto for uh, his, his grid and design philosophy. And notice it's a philosophy. In this book, he's not just talking about a practical way of working. He sees this ordering system as, as a way to shape a worldview. It's geared towards, it's looking towards the future. It's constructive, but it also expresses a certain ethos, right? He says that it is both uh, mathematical and, the, and therefore the work should contribute to general culture. We'll get a couple other examples. Again, he's thinking about something that should be objective. I think that this is problematic in some ways. Is there really such a thing as objective design? Is there really one correct way that is better than, than other ways? I think that that's hard to sort of say that there's one perfectly objective way of designing or a perfectly objective way of seeing the world. But for, for a designer like Joseph Mueller Brockman, this objective thinking should also be democratic, right? It should also it, it should also uh, create something that works for everyone, something that appeals to all people throughout our culture. You know, oh, one more example. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened. We're getting very pixelated here. Uh, something wrong with my image. I apologize for that. Despite that, this is a really, this is one of the most well-known posters from uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman. If you look up Mueller Brockman Beethoven, you can find a better image of this poster. But the objective, the democratic, is based on this idea of the universal. It's a fascinating idea. And the Swiss typographers, the, the, the Swiss style is based on the idea of striving towards a universal appeal. I think this is a major question. Can these designs be universal? Especially when every designer in, who created as part of the Swiss style was a white man and usually a fairly wealthy white man too. So are they really making something that's universal or are they making something that only appears to a certain audience? Are there qualities in the work that will appeal to all human eyes or is the way of looking at these something that's conditioned by the modern world. I know that these are very abstract questions, but I think they are ones that are worth contemplating. In any event, the designers in this school certainly had a major impact on all design that would follow. For, for decades, you were either sort of creating something that was influenced by this style or at best creating something that rejected this style. Maybe it's changed a little bit now, that's another question for you to answer. There is one design that I think is particularly interesting and plays directly off of this approach. And this is just an example um, from, that's more contemporary that I think is really fascinating for good or bad. In 2013, the Whitney Museum rebranded, uh, they, they redid their brand identity and use a design from called Experimental Jet Set that does very cool work. And Experimental Jet Set essentially devised a program, not maybe, maybe not directly referencing Carl Gerstner, but certainly following the logic of 
the international style of the Swiss style and playing with grids with a program and developing this approach to the Whitney's new design. It's based on the simple sans serif writing the word Whitney and always accompanied by this W that can take different shapes. The, there's different forms that the program can take depending on where it, it, the logo appears, whether it's letterhead or a notepad. And then you see for the different uh, the different contexts here, it is repeated uh, for ticket stubs. And when you enter the museum, you still get a ticket that looks something like this. Or on tote bags, we can have all sorts of different variations on this W design. And then a fun sort of early promotional material that they were handing out was this, this little game where you scramble and unscramble. So you have a grid set on top of the program and it's certainly a kind of meta, joke having to do with the international style with the swiss style so again i think there are a lot of questions regarding the validity the universality the clarity of the type of approach that the swiss style calls for but love it or hate it this is an approach that has had a huge influence not just stylistically but also Practically, what we do digitally today is largely based on the methods that people like Carl Gerstner and Joseph Mueller Brockman developed. I hope you have questions about this school. I hope that you question it. I hope that there are elements from the readings that you found problematic or interesting. And Again, I, I like to see them added to this post. We don't have a separate discussion this week because of individual meetings, but please comment on this post with your thoughts on the international style, on the Swiss style, on the readings for this week. Thanks. <laughs>